all attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Hi. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I wanted to welcome you to today's NOAA Marine Protected Area Center webinar. Um, this webinar is co-hosted by the EBM Tools Network, um, MPA News, and OpenChannels.org. Um, I'm Sarah Carr. I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, or EBM Tools Network for short. Um, Lauren Wenzel uh, was unfortunately not able to be here today to, to uh, moderate, so I'm standing in for her. Um, and we'd like to welcome Brad Barr of NOAA, who will be presenting today. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Brad, um, Brad received a Bachelor of Science from the University of Maine, a Master of Science from UMass, and a PhD from the University of Alaska. He's currently a senior advisor in the NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries Maritime Heritage Program. He's a member of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas, the International Committee on Marine Mammal Protected Areas, and the IUCN Marine Mammal Protected Area Task Force. He served on the boards of directors of the George Wright Society in the U.S., the Science and Management of Protected Areas Association, SAMPA, in Canada, and is currently on the board of directors of the Coastal Zone Canada Association. Um, he also serves on the editorial board of the World Maritime University Journal of Maritime Affairs. He has published extensively on marine protected area science and management, the identification and management of ocean wilderness, whaling heritage, and maritime heritage preser preservation. He, most recently, he was chief scientist and co-principal investigator on an expedition to the Arctic to map and document whaling shipwrecks in the nearshore waters of the Chukchi Sea. And as I was telling him, he has a much more interesting life than I do. Um, so we're, we're very pleased to have Brad here to speak about the lost whaling fleets of the Western Arctic. Before I turn this over to Brad, though, I wanted to let you guys uh, know one thing. Um, we'll be We'll be taking questions at the end of the webinar. Um, there's, there's dedicated time for question and answer. If you want to send in a question, there's a question panel in your user interface. Um, you can type the question in, and I'll relay it to Brad. Um, so feel free to send questions in during the presentation. Um, uh, I will save the substantive ones for the question and answer period at the end. I'll, but if you have a, just a quick clarifying question, um, I might stop Brad and ask him during the webinar, uh, during his presentation. So anyway, just wanted to let you know about that option, and we, we highly encourage uh, questions during the, during the uh, question and answer period at the end. Okay. Well, thanks, Brad. We're very glad you could be here today. I'll turn it over to you now. Well, thanks a lot. I, uh, uh, I appreciate being invited to come and talk about our expedition this summer. And I uh, wanted to mention that I'm making this presentation uh, on behalf of myself and uh, Matthew Lawrence, who's, uh, who was uh, a, a big part of the mission team for this, uh, for this project and uh, uh, very instrumental in, in the, any of the successes we had, and I'm responsible for any of the failures. So, uh, But uh, anyway, uh, uh, we're, uh, we're trying now to see if we can advance the slides. There we go. Uh, the overview of the presentation today, we're going to talk a little bit about why we went to the Arctic, what we set, to, set out to do there, um, maybe touch on what's next, and then uh, focus on what was accomplished, particularly focused on lessons learned. Um, I am, uh, those of you who know me know that I have a tendency to, uh, to wander off into the weeds and tell stories, so uh, I'm going to try to stick to a script uh, and uh, uh, and uh, try not to make it sound too much like reading, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Actually, interestingly enough, now that I've been hanging around with a bunch of historians, uh, one of the things I found is that when they do their presentations, they almost all, always read them, which is kind of unusual for those of us who are in the natural sciences. And uh, so uh, it's, uh, maybe it's just because most historians are older than scientists are. I don't know. But anyway, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the upshot is, is that I'll be talking a little bit, uh, uh, trying to stay to the script. See, that's what happens. I get wander off. Uh, okay, so uh, why we went to the Arctic? It's a the area of the coastal waters of the Chukchi Sea saw a loss of approximately 50 whaling ships within a five-year period in the 1870s. This has been widely attributed to as one of the contributory causes of the demise of commercial commercial whaling in the United States, which represented one of the most important elements of the American economy in the 19th century. These lost 
occurrences are considered highly significant events in the history of American whaling, and this part of the Chukchi Coast is unparalleled importance in the global whaling heritage landscape. What might remain today of the shipwrecked whaling fleet was largely unknown. We saw this as a way to help write the final chapter of the story and to better understand, if anything was still worthy of preservation, what might be done to accomplish this. Next slide. Whaling was one of, if not the first, truly global industries, providing oil to light the cities of the world, to promote safe navigation by illuminating lighthouses, and to lubricate the machines of the industrial age, among many other contributions. In the United States, which was the epicenter of this industry, it influenced our diplomacy, increased our knowledge of the remote corners of the world, particularly the seas that supported the whales we hunted, and drove the American economy through the late 18th and early 19th, and throughout the 19th century. Somewhat like the internet today, it made the world smaller by broadening our knowledge of it, opening the doors to remote and exotic places through the press reports and the exploits of these whaling ships that roamed the seas in search of Leviathan. There are few places where whaling ships did not explore, constantly in search of new whaling grounds, places where whales could be taken efficiently and most economically. In the later 19th century, it was not uncommon for whalers to make voyages of three years, visiting ports around the world for provisions and repairs, sailing to places known to be productive grounds, the places that held the promise of what they called a greasy season. Given the many important ways that whaling shaped and influenced the U.S. and world history, this is a, this is a heritage worth preserving. This is a history bound to particular places, the sort of place-based preservation and stewardship that our rich, of our rich maritime heritage provided by the National Marine Sanctuary System uh, offers opportunities to find and protect these historically important places and the cultural landscapes in which they're situated for the benefit of future generations. All of these places have stories that resonate today, are relevant to our understanding the endurance, adaptability, and resilience of our ancestors in confronting and overcoming challenges they face. Lessons learned that, uh, that should not be forgotten and can help guide us, guide and inform the decisions we must make as we face similar challenges today. The National Marine Sanctuary System is the primary stewardship and management program established by Congress nearly 50 years ago to preserve, protect, and manage areas of the marine environment of special national significance. The places that have, uh, have been designated as our National Marine Sanctuaries include areas of all, our, all of our oceans and Great Lakes focused on providing effective stewardship of both ecosystem and maritime heritage resources. And I just make the side note that uh, if you look at this map, you'll see there's uh, nothing north of Olympic Coast. Uh, there are no areas in Alaska that have been designated. Given this apparent gap in the representation of all of our region, all regions of the U.S. waters in the NMS system, one might presume that we went to the Arctic to scout out a new potential sanctuary. However, we actually went because there was an undeniable significance in the American and global whaling heritage landscape to expand our knowledge and understanding of this important place, particularly to determine what physically remains from the many whaling ships lost there to the ice and storms of the past, to determine what might be threatened by the changing climate and expanding human uses that are likely to come as the ice recedes. In August of 1871, 40 whaling ships from Hawaii, New England, and California had come to an area north of Wainwright Inlet along the Chukchi Sea coast in pursuit of walrus and bowhead whales. The pack ice being close to shore that year left little room for maneuvering of the fleet. The whaling captains counted on a wind shift from the east to drive the pack out to sea, as it had done and had always done in years past. Instead uh, of moving offshore, the pack ice trapped 32 ships between the ice and shore in a constantly and quickly diminishing stretch of open water with no chance to sail out. Concluding that their ships, uh, that escape with their ships was impossible, the captains elected to evacuate all 1,219 men as well as women and children who happened to be on board. Uh, uh, it wasn't uncommon for whaling captains to bring their families, uh, given that they were gone from home for three years, uh, by way of the ship's whaleboats. 
In these frail craft, the ship's crews dragged the whale boats across the jagged landscape of ice to open leads, then rowed and sailed 90 miles south past Icy Cape, where they were rescued by seven other whaling ships whose passage south was unhindered by the ice. Although the journey required them to endure this difficult and dangerous passage through ice-choked and heavy seas, no lives were lost in this man mass abandonment. Of all of the ships abandoned in the Arctic in 1871, only one ever sailed again. The remaining 31 vessels were crushed by the ice, sunk or burned near Point Belcher. A similar fate awaited 12 more whaling ships nearby at Point Barrow in 1876, but this time the survivors of these ice-bound vessels were not, a, not all as fortunate, with 47 men losing their lives stranded on the ice. Based on uh, previous field work conducted by a team led by Randy Beebe, uh, we, were we were aware that there were pieces of wreckage that had been identified and documented uh, along the, sh the beaches of this stretch of coast. However, no one had been able to successfully address what might ju be just offshore. Uh, this is the challenge we had come to take on, so a systematic archaeological uh, archaeological survey of the nearshore waters of po from Point Franklin to Wainwright Inlet. Uh, this gives you a, a, a map of, uh, of, of BB and his team's finding. The red dots are locations of shipwreck material. Uh, there were some, I think, 241 different uh, places where they uh, where they found wreckage. Uh, uh, there were also uh, uh, a number of these pieces of wreckage that, over the years, were incorporated in the dwellings and structures in the in particularly in Wainwright. Uh, this information was used to help identify the survey area for our mission. So, given that, uh, given the more than 50 documented whaling ships lost between 1850 and 1900 in this relatively discreet area of the Chukchi Coast, we assembled a team of experienced maritime archaeologists and seabed mapping experts and went to the Arctic to look for sh whaling shipwrecks. To accomplish this, we needed to engage the services of a charter vessel, which is quite challenging for such a remote area, uh, as there are few who operate here. Um, and it needs to be a vessel that can operate in very shallow water, support seabed mapping operations using very sophisticated underwater ma acoustic mapping systems, and have an experienced and knowledgeable captain who possesses sufficient local knowledge to be able to avoid the many shoals and to know where to hide when the in inevitable storms arrive. We were very fortunate to find, in finding the RV Yukbik, uh, which we found could meet all of those requirements. We arrived in Prudhoe Bay on August 8th to begin a three-week-long project. After, after the 16-hour transit from the, to the survey area through, the fields of, through fields of small icebergs in the Beaufort Sea, we began to collect data. Well, Actually, we completed the installation and calibration of the mapping systems while we awaited for better weather. Uh, that, was, uh, that was kind of a, a recurring theme in the project, is that the weather in August is, uh, the, there may be not a lot of ice, but there certainly is a lot of weather. Uh, the, as the, the slide notes, the survey area included all the last known positions of the 1871 wrecks, which were pretty well documented. Uh, the average depth in the survey area was approximately 28 feet, which was, uh, which was uh, a kind of a challenge because mapping in shallow water is always uh, uh, labor-intensive, uh, and it requires special systems, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, the, uh, and we were working in an area that was approximately 37 kilometers of coastline between uh, Wainwright Inlet, Inlet and Point Franklin. And this is, uh, if you see my, my uh, cursor there, this is Wainwright Inlet. Village of Wainwright, that's Point Belcher, which is sort of where the coast breaks, Point Belcher, Point Franklin, uh, and this is Purd Bay, where we spent a great deal of time hiding from the weather. The primary mapping system we used was an ex was uh, in the first leg of the cruise was a Edge Tech 6205 multiphase echo sounder, which was loaned to us by Edge Tech, uh, and it was fitted with an Aplanix uh, uh, POSMV version 5 Wavemaster IMU, uh, which creates a co-registered side scan sonar and multi-beam sonar uh, with a swath width of about 12 times the water depth. Um, it required sophisticated positioning and attitude uh, sensor in order to account for vessel movement. Um, it was uh, it was the I think the perfect uh, uh, shallow water system for this, and we're very fortunate to uh, have. Uh, 
for EdgeTech to have loaned this, uh, that particular instrument, a piece of instrumentation. The primary mapping system used in leg two uh, was uh, an EdgeTech 4125 uh, side scan sonar, which was on loan from the Office of Coast Survey. Uh, it's a towed system with uh, high resolution, uh, but didn't, in contrast to the 6205, collect bathymetry. Uh, one of the reasons why we used the 6205 was we could we could collect both bathymetry and backs and uh, uh, and side scan. We also were uh, conducting magnetometry th uh, simultaneously with the side scan sonar throughout the mission. The intent was to use the great uh, was to use the gradiometer, which was the the system over here that had the two fish with the with the metal frame, or actually it's a non-metal frame, uh, 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 which provides more sensitivity. That is, it can t detect smaller objects. But the cave, the towfish failed, and while we did mo so we did most of the data collection with one fish. Uh, in that, in this setup, as shown on the right, we also used something called a, a base station for the magnetometry. It was loaned to us by the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It was installed on the barrier beach between Point Belcher and Point Franklin, and it's used to register the data collected by the towfish against background re variations in the local magnetic field. Uh, this data was also collected continuously during the mission. Uh, and it added some interesting complexities to the uh, to the mission. Uh, one of the other things we did was we we uh, uh, developed a new drop camera system uh, that was purpose built for the mission uh, uh, to investigate the sonar targets. We chose to use this technology rather than diving to avoid safety issues arriving rising from diving in such a remote location. Uh, I don't even know where the nearest uh, uh, hyperbaric chamber is to this particular location. Although we were working in in largely shallow water. And because it was simpler and less prone to unexpected operation, operational failures than an ROV, it used uh, lights, a real-time pilot video camera, uh, two to three simple off-the-shelf underwater video cameras mounted on a heavy frame, and during the mission we collected almost 100 gigabytes of, of video and still images. The drop camera was developed uh, with the assistance of three UN engineering students from the University of New Hampshire uh, who contributed uh, uh, not only their, their, their engineering expertise in developing this uh, instrument, but also contributed an essay uh, that was on their work that's been included in the mission web page pages. And it's, uh, it was great to work with the students on the developing this piece of equipment. Uh, this gives a sense of the uh, uh, map of the survey area that was completed. Uh, this is at a relatively large scale, so it, it doesn't look like much. Uh, but it's actually quite a very large area. Uh, the North Sur Survey area extends just from uh, from just south of Point Belcher, which is right here. This is the North Survey area from south of Point Belcher up to Point Fra up just past Point Franklin, uh, where we used the 6205 to collect bathymetry and side scan, uh, as well as magnetometry throughout. Um, the South Survey area was from just south of Point Belcher down to almost Wainwright Inlet. Uh, uh, and uh, we were using the 4125 toad system for that. Since the sun never set fully during the first couple of weeks of our uh, of the project, which is the nice thing about working in the Arctic, uh, we stood uh, uh, we were standing watches 24 hours a day. However, uh, the stormy weather and rough seas forced us to seek shelter more often than we had hoped uh, in Perd Bay, which is this this area right here. It's one of the few places where you can actually get away from. Uh, the weather. There's a there's a underneath this this Point Franklin. There's actually an island here called Seahorse Island. That's just a very low barrier, but it does have some protection, and uh, but it's very shallow, and you have to know where you're going. So what was accomplished? Well, we mapped uh, around 49 square kilometers kilometers of the seabed. We covered discovered six pieces of wreckage on the seabed. Uh, with the acoustic sensors and, and one in just the past week, uh, uh, Matt uh, was going over some of the side scan data and found a sixth, uh, a sixth target. We identified three areas for magnetometry that are likely to be um, uh, pieces of wrecks buried in the seabed. Uh, this is a very highly dynamic sedimentary environment and uh, uh, it's not, uh, we believe that there's, uh, it's clear that there is uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, 
there's quite a bit of wreckage, and I'll, I'll, uh, I will, or at least pieces of wreckage, and I'll show that in just a minute. Um, it, clearly, these aren't anything. Uh, this is a series of shots that show the side scan records and some of the characteristics of the uh, of the wreckage that we discovered. They're not anything like intact wrecks. But it's remarkable that these have faced it, that have persisted approximately 144 years uh, uh, on the seabed, uh, uh, given the disturbance from the sea, the fast ice or ice that's grounded on the bottom every year, um, in around 15 or 20 feet of water. Um, that anything stills there is, uh, I think, is pretty remarkable. And you can see this is uh, the first site. This is a little hard to see, but this is the second site. It's a wooden lower hull with the keels in the floors and the build ceiling. Uh, this is the one where we found uh, quite a number of artifacts, uh, including a, an anchor and chain. Uh, there was a, a dead eye strop, which is part of the rigging, and a triworks knee. And I'll talk about those in a bit. And there were there were lots of uh, iron and copper alloy fastenings present at just about all the sites. Uh, this one is uh, the third one. It was the lower hull of a wood vessel uh, with some rock uh, ballast. Not uh, there were uh, a, one of these had uh, actually had iron ballast, iron ingot ballast, which is something that's kind of interesting, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. There were the other three were ones. The first three we looked at with the drop camera, and I had you have some pictures. The, uh, the the fourth, fifth, and sixth ones were were ones that we did not have time to uh, investigate. This looks like it might be uh, wire rigging. Uh, the the fifth one is another piece of wreckage. Uh, again, it's adjacent to this uh, site four, which is where the rigging is. Uh, again, another piece of uh, wreckage. I, that would have been a really interesting one to look at. We just, uh, as I say, ran out of time, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. And this is the one Matt just found. Uh, it's a three-component target. Again, we didn't have a chance to look at it with the camera, but uh, it's clear that there's uh, that there is wreckage in that place. So what did we what did we see? Well, in the top left, one of the things we saw was uh, you can see that little bit of rust. Uh, those are iron ingots uh, that were used as ballast uh, in one of these ships, in this in the ship that's represented in WNS2, the WNS2 site. And uh, this is kind of interesting because it's not typically used in whaling ships, so it may be a diagnostic feature that we can use to help uh, identify the wreck. Uh, that's a pretty big long shot, but uh, but we're going to try that anyway. We're looking at it to see whether. Uh, any of them were known to carry iron, iron ingot ballast, but most of most of them have uh, just round rock ballast that you'd expect. But you can see the the kinds of wreckage that we that we saw. You know this this particular one, this WNS one, actually was sticking up into the water uh, uh, three or four three or four or five feet. So these uh, pieces of uh, beam uh, of uh, of rib were were actually sticking up into the water. Okay, I'm going to give you another shot at that. Uh, that's a uh, that was a, a video that showed the uh, <clears throat> that showed the anchor on WNS1, um, and we're gonna I'm going to play that again so you can take a look. Uh, you can see it in the lower right hand corner. Uh, it was uh, leaning up against the wreckage. Up, oh, up, oh, up. Oh, go back. Sorry. Let's. We got too many videos. We'll come back to that one. We just saw an anchor there. That wasn't it? Yeah, that was a different one. Okay. 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 So let's watch this one again. And you can see sort of vaguely uh, there's the anchor. There's the, 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 the curved part of the anchor. There's the, the anchor, uh, the anchor uh, uh, shaft. And so watch that as it comes towards it. And look particularly behind the anchor. Uh, never mind. Anyway, there were some other... Uh, Artifacts. This is the the WNS that had the place that had most of the anchor, most of the artifacts. There's the rigging strop, the anchor, and there's a big anchor chain there. Um, it was uh, uh, it was a uh, a very uh, uh, amazing to us that there were so many artifacts, and this is only part of the 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 artifacts that that we that we thought we 
discovered but didn't uh, weren't able to identify specifically. Anchors are easy. Uh, rigging straps are obviously pretty easy when they're in that kind of condition, but some of the others are a little bit more uh, difficult to define what they are. A lot of hoops and might be barrel hoops and things like that. Um, so anyway, uh, these are some still pictures that show these. This is the this is on WNS2. This is the anchor that we saw, the rigging strop, and something called a triworks knee. Uh, that's right here. That's also right here the rigging strop and the anchor, and then the chain is just off to, to the top about where that triworks knee is. And just to give you a sense of what the context for what a triworks knee is, that's, that's this piece down here. And that actually is, is, we think, is one of these knees that holds up the side of the triworks. And the triworks was the place that the blubber was boiled down uh, into oil uh, uh, on board. So that's what we think that artifact is. This map identifies a zone within the northern survey area where numerous magnetic anomalies were concentrated. There were no sonar targets, that is, nothing on the surface that could be identified with sonar uh, found within this area. The contoured magnetic uh, gradient data revealed a broadly scattered field of uh, individual ferrous objects that do not create a multi-component magnetic structure of, con of a concentrated wreck site. Uh, these are all pieces of metal. That have that were registered on the uh, on the magnetometer, and then corrected with the base station data. Uh, these are from the southern zone. Uh, the southern magnet. This is uh, again an area where you can see there's a tremendous amount of uh, of of metal that's that's buried in the sediment. We don't know how deep it is. Uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, we don't know uh, what it what it actually is, but there seems to be concentration areas of these pieces of metal. And and if you think about it, a 19th century ship really did carry quite a bit of metal in it, whether it was the the keel bolts or whether it was uh, fastenings or pieces of the rigging or whatever. As a matter of fact, a lot of those vessels carried uh, carried a uh, uh, a blacksmith on be able to, to repair and, and replace a lot of the equipment. So um, it's not, you know, it wouldn't be inconsistent to have a 19th century shipwreck have, uh, you know, give this kind of, a, uh, this amount of metal uh, contribute that to the, uh, to the baseline. But they're clear, it's clear that there are con very significant concentrations of, uh, of uh, magnetic objects. The project team hypothesizes that the magnetic anomalies represent locations where several ships were broken apart and the resulting wreckage ground into small pieces and buried by wave action uh, on, the, on this dynamic part of the coast. Um, it is uh, um, uh, well, uh, it is uh, uh, it, it would take uh, additional work in order to be able to follow this up, but but uh, we're reasonably certain that it's from that it's from these ships, from these 50 odd ships that were lost between 18, uh, 1850 and 1900. Uh, there were, and the the thing that makes uh, makes it more likely that they're from ship whaling shipwrecks is because there were only 50 ships that were lost in this particular stretch of coast, and they were all whaling ships. So we're reasonably certain that if if there if there are artifacts that we found either on the surface or buried beneath the surface that they come from these these whaling ships that were lost in this area. As we as we neared the end of the survey window and began to interpret our results, we observed that the whale ship remains appeared to be behind a shoal that extended along the coast. We hypothesized that the shoal protected the shipwrecks to some extent from the sea ice. Also prevented uh, a complete survey of the furthest inshore waters because it got very shallow and and then there was that that uh, you can see in this in this image the, uh, the, the 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 sort of the the hint of a shoal very close to shore. Um, it's likely the same shoal that may have created the lead of open water that allowed the whaling crews to escape. And if you look at, uh, you know, doing a little bit of historical ecology here, if you, if you look at the, uh, uh, you look at these images that were, this was actually based on a, a, 
a drawing that was done by one of the whaling captains that uh, that was that abandoned their ship in, at this point. Uh, this was in the Harper's Weekly in 1871, and you'll see that there is this very distinct open water area between the the buildup of ice and the shoreline, and there is another uh, series of lithographs uh, that show almost precisely the same thing. Here's the shore, here's the ice, and here's this open water stretch uh, that's probably behind the, uh, uh, probably between the, uh, uh, that shoal and the, and the inshore waters. Uh, it's, not, it's not clear on the chart that there is a shoal, but, uh, uh, but you can see that uh, if you look at the bathymetry we collected, we found what appears to be the remnants of the shoal in places within the survey area, less evident in areas between Point Franklin and Point Belcher, the North Survey area, uh, uh, because it's a much more dynamic area. The re there was a report uh, released by USGS on historic shorelines in this area that was released just before we left uh, for for uh, for Prudhoe in 2015 this summer, and suggests that the retreated shoreline in this area is relatively moderate when compared to other areas along the Arctic coastline. If you think about the the idea of the archaeological site formation that may be going on, you know the 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 sediment that buried these things had to come from someplace, and we're we're hypothesizing that the sediment uh, that that was uh, that's very dynamic and and but but was moving uh, offshore as a result of being eroded, uh, actually was being contributed by this uh, by this uh, bar in uh, 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 that was just offshore. Uh, in, particularly in those areas up towards Point Franklin. So, what are the principal findings of what we're we're hoping to be able to what, we're, what we found when we went up there? Well, we answered the question we went to uh, this place in order to address, uh, which is: is there wreckage? And indeed, after 144 years uh, in the survey area and exposed to the seabed, there is exposed on the seabed. There is indeed at least six pieces of wreckage. Uh, that is still identifiable. There's more wreckage likely to be present but appears to be buried in the seabed. And we're providing all this information to the State of Alaska Office of History and Archaeology. Uh, we are working within state waters and we're required uh, to have a permit from the state in order to do this as well as from a whole bunch of other people. Uh, but, uh, 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 and we're, we think that uh, the, these resources can probably be protected very uh, very uh, uh, effectively through the the application of uh, National Historic Preservation Act Section 106, which reviews the uh, the uh, impacts of uh, uh, of development activities on uh, uh, on these uh, on these historic resources, and it's required of all projects. So, uh, in this case, it's probably the the most effective way of uh, protecting the resources. Uh, and there were a lot of lessons learned. The, the one of the lessons learned, I think, that was important was the Arctic doesn't give, a, give up its secrets easily. The weather was extremely problematic. We were routinely working in four to six foot seas uh, with some calmer days, uh, which seems to be when all the pictures were taken. I don't know why that was. Maybe it's because we weren't holding on for dear life uh, trying to take pictures. Uh, but anyway, uh, the worst seas were about 19 feet and 35 knots sustained winds. Uh, where we were hiding in Perd Bay uh, for two days, it really tested the durability of the systems uh, and the and the, the the mission team, I have to say. Um, and there was and we did experience some failures. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the mags were certainly the magnetometers were certainly worse for wear. Uh, we lost a, a number of pieces, including the full tail section on this one, uh, and a bunch of fins on this one, and and uh, uh, had a cable failure early on. Um, we had uh, uh, we had the uh, the bow mount here, which you can see is a very very thick piece of stainless steel, and you'll notice that at the end of the mission, when we when we were taking it off, we noticed that it had bent. So it, we didn't hit the bottom with the instrument; we just uh, uh, it just bent the. Uh, uh, the piece of metal, which was uh, I think pretty amazing, and shows the kind of kind of weather we were dealing with. Um, it's just a very difficult place to work. Uh, we had a plan B and a plan C for every major system deployed. It was one of the reasons why we shipped nearly 20 crates totaling almost a ton of gear to Prudhoe Bay. Uh, it was one of the biggest uh, single pieces of, uh, 
uh, of the of the budget that we spent was to uh, get them get the equipment there and back again because we had to have so many backups. Um, we uh, uh, the pro we had a prototype camera system uh, that that failed almost immediately. Uh, we had a mag cable failure that made the radiometer impossible. Uh, you, you, the the IMU failed. Uh, we had a, a couple of other things, but the bottom line was that it's a very difficult place, as I say, to work. And but one of the things we discovered was that if you have a Plan B and a Plan C, it can get you through. And in fact, that's what that we were pretty pleased with the fact that we actually made it back uh, with uh, at least some of the equipment intact. Um, Given the unusually bad weather and the rarity of places in this part of the, uh, of the Arctic to hide inshore, you need a capable platform that not only can handle the weather, but captains that know where to hide and how to navigate into places where mere mortals would not dream of attempting. We spent a lot of time in the very shallow waters of Perd Bay, behind the barrier islands between Frank, Point Franklin and Point Belcher, hiding uh, and uh, calibrating equipment, which we did almost, uh, almost the whole time we were inside. Uh, Mike and Arthur, the, the captain, the two captains, we had two captains because we were working 24-hour ops, um, knew how to ease the boat into these places with uh, no piers or wharves except in Prudhoe Bay, some 16 hours away from the survey area. Most of the landings were controlled groundings on beaches. And uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, uh, you also have, uh, in working in the Arctic, you also have a, uh, uh, it's always good to have somebody who knows something about firearms. Uh, we had a, uh, to my knowledge, uh, this is the only NOAA cruise, at least to my knowledge, where the cruise plan included a section on bear avoidance. Um, and uh, uh, we didn't see any bears, but uh, we were very uh, cautious about, uh, about that. Uh, one of the lessons learned, uh, an important one, is it takes a great team to turn the vision into reality. And in this case, we had, uh, we had Vitad Pradith, who used to work for CoSurvey. Uh, that's Matt. Uh, Evan Martial is uh, is an engineer from uh, uh, from EdgeTech who came uh, came with the equipment to help us use it. V, of course, is the guru of seabed mapping and uh, now works for HiPAC, and, and that's me. Uh, I was along for for just show, I think. Um, and then uh, you need a great team that includes the seabed mapping experts, but also the archaeologists, Hans van Tilburg, of course, my boss Jim Delgado. Matt, who's also an archaeologist, and then Mike Fleming and, and uh, Arthur Schwartz, the uh, the two captains. It was uh, it was a tremendous team, and we couldn't have done it without uh, having that kind of talent on board. Uh, we had to adapt constantly because of the the uh, in things that we were encountering along the way. Another one is that uh, the mission couldn't have been seriously contemplated, let alone conducted, without the contributions of our industry and agency partners. Um, they weren't just silent partners, but active participants. Uh, Evan from EdgeTech, uh, uh, VTED from HiPAC were both on board for the first leg of the mission. Uh, Eplanix loaned us a piece of equipment that you know that that uh, is uh, cost more than my annual salary, and just uh, was very generous in their uh, in that. Uh, we got a lot of good advice on, on coordination, coordination with the locals from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Alaska, Alaska region. Uh, they're very good at uh, and very knowledgeable about that. Uh, we had uh, a terrific, uh, 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 have a terrific relationship with the Office of Coast Survey, and they were extremely generous in loaning us their 4125 uh, and some other equipment that was essential. So these public-private partnerships are are pretty essential. One of the other things I wanted to talk about in terms, and the last one I want to talk about in terms of lesson learned, is that is this notion of using platforms of opportunity to do integrated coastal and ocean management. I've been a long-standing advocate of ICOM, and and contrary to the advice of our maritime archaeologists, who who really only wanted the side scan, uh, we set out to, to collect the bathymetry with the 60 to 205 in this cruise because because I believed it was important for us. Uh, if we were going to be on site, and because uh, it, it is an area that is not uh, very robustly mapped, uh, that we collect uh, bathymetry. Uh, with a little time, with little time to do installation of the system before embarking, most was accomplished in the field uh, of installing and 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 uh, uh, and uh, uh, developing the uh, um, the uh, making the systems work the way they were supposed to. Um, achieving centimeter precisions in offsets, that is the distances between some of the sensors that need to be 
uh, within centimeters. Uh, doing that in the field uh, is a, an extremely challenging thing to do. Um, when the cable, uh, uh, and, and this was done on a vessel that we had never used before, didn't have any of the measurements. We were doing a lot of these offset measurements with, with, a, with a boat hook and a, and a measuring tape. And so it's a very difficult thing to do, and it's not as easy as uh, as as it might uh, as it might seem when we talk pretty facilely about uh, uh, using platforms of opportunity for ICOM. Uh, when the cable and the IMU failed, uh, we had to rely on a backup, and this required another additional uh, amount of time in order to calibrate this. While we did collect bathymetry, the quality was somewhat diminished after the failure of the IMU uh, cable. A hard lesson learned here, I think. Uh, was that perhaps we should be more realistic in understanding and communicating the potential of platforms of opportunity, uh, particularly when interacting with less potential, t technically sophisticated audience uh, of potential end users. Um, I think that it's a lot harder, uh, having done it now, I think it's a lot harder than people give it, than people tend to make it seem uh, as we talk about using these platforms of opportunity. I think there are ways to overcome these things. It's just that uh, uh, you have to be really on top of it in order to be able to uh, be prepared to use this kind of a platform. Um, just touch a little bit on potential future research. We do not anticipate returning to the site, but we certainly hope that others will. Um, the wreckage sites are in very shallow water and formal archaeological documentation could be accomplished reasonably and expensively with SCUBA. Uh, we've been told by a number of locals that wreckage has been reused for a number of purposes, including beams in local homes and various repurposing of the bronze keel bolts. It'd be really interesting to, to uh, work with the community to document this reuse. Uh, the, uh, there's a potential for doing some sub-bottom profiling uh, to further investigate the uh, any of the of these uh, in these areas where there are anomaly concentrations to see what we could find in the seabed this uh, uh, picture down here is a uh, is some sub uh, sub bottom profiling that was done that shows the wreck of a ship uh, uh, from uh, I believe it's someplace in Europe um, it'd be a way to further identify uh, important wreck sites within the areas of the mag anomalies uh, there was a similar abandonment, uh, as I mentioned, in 1876 off Point Barrow, uh, and this area should be surveyed as well. And it, because it's deeper and may contain and likely to contain more intact wrecks, because uh, it's not as subject to the uh, uh, to the ravages of the ground ice, uh, the yearly ground ice disturbances, uh, it would be a place that uh, definitely should be uh, take someone should take a look at. Finally, the extension of the survey area north and west. Uh, there in, later on in 1898, there were the loss of a, a number of uh, steam whalers, including the vessel Orca and the vessel Jesse Freeman. Uh, the Orca actually has a really interesting story because it uh, actually blew up uh, at, from the pressure of the ice, sending uh, pieces of its steering gear uh, flying through the air at great distances, uh, uh, quite uh, quite amount of force. Uh, we think there was an artif un unknown artifact sound found on the beach near Wainwright, um, and we think this may be uh, a piece of that uh, uh, of that steering gear from the Orca. That uh, uh, we're not sure, but it's speculated that it's spe we speculate that that may be the case. Uh, it seems to match uh, uh, some of what that gear might look like, and this was found on the beach, so it, it couldn't just have floated there. Obviously, it's a big piece of metal, so uh, it must have been. Uh, uh, must have been uh, certainly if it didn't fly there, it got dragged there somehow. But anyway, this is uh, another thing that might be worth taking a look at. Um, and I wanted to say one final note. Uh, you'll note that uh, the Inup we haven't talked much about the the whaling heritage of the Inupiat. The Inupiat of the Arctic have a very long and important whaling heritage with deep cultural significance. It's an essential element of the whaling heritage landscape of the Western Arctic upon which the history of the Yankee whaling is superimposed. And we do not, out of respect, tell, the sto tell this story as part of our narrative, as these are not our stories to tell. Someday we hope to have the opportunity to support the Inupiat as they weave their red into this rich fabric of whaling heritage in the Western Arctic. Uh, but, uh, but we have been very uh, uh, specific about not wanting to uh, um, not wanting to tell stories that are not our stories to tell. 
So, despite the many setbacks and challenges we encountered over the decade we've been working on this Lost Fleets of the Western Arctic project, uh, we're grateful to many people who made our expedition possible, including particularly our colleagues uh, at the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, who provided the funding, a uh, particular call out to, to uh, Frank Cantellis, their archaeologist, who's been, uh, who's been uh, uh, just terrific in uh, helping us make things happen. Uh, our critically important industry and agency partners, uh, the owners and captains of the, of the RV Yukbik, uh, and the many ON ONMS support personnel who navigated the always challenging NOAA procurement processes we needed to complete in record time before we could head north to conduct the survey. Uh, the final lesson learned, I guess, from this expedition is that, uh, as, uh, as has been said by somebody currently much in the news, is that it takes a village. So thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, my contact information is up on the top of this slide. Uh, there are a couple of uh, web pages that are worth checking out. Uh, the background information on the Lost Fleets of the Western Arctic Project, this is the 10-year the project we've been working on. There's a very rich content. Uh, the uh, Ocean Explorer web page that has the mission web page uh, and uh, uh, the, the uh, sanctuary uh, web page hosted the, the uh, uh, the press release, which has a number of the pictures that I've used today uh, uh, and others uh, uh, that document the, uh, the mission. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll be glad to answer any questions we have time for. Okay. Thank you, Brad. This was fascinating. Um, and definitely a change of pace from our norm normal. Uh, it's great to get the archaeology talks. Um, Okay, so I just wanted to reiterate, uh, you guys, all, everyone attending can ask questions, so just type the questions into the question panel of your user interface, and I'll relay them to Brad. Um, so there were a couple questions that came in, and I had a couple other questions. Uh, I'll go back to the ones that came in from the audience uh, during the presentation, uh, and it says, the seabed looks mostly coarse and erosional, non-depositional. Is this correct? I think you did actually address that, but yeah, I, I, it was mostly uh, it was a very dynamic environment. Uh, one of the things I wasn't able to put my hands on was uh, was a, 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 a side scan sonar record. We have the side scan uh, image for all of the the, the area that we mapped, uh, and there are big areas of ripples, sand waves. Uh, mega ripples. Uh, there's everything you could possibly find. It's uh, it's not a featureless bottom at all, and it definitely shows that there is a lot of sediment movement in that area. Uh, if it's depositional, it would happen. It, it would be carrying fine sediments, and there aren't very many fine sediments up there. Uh, so there, it's mostly coarse sand, uh, and uh, a lot of that would be transported further offshore. Okay, oh, and do you specifically uh, do you see ice gouges on the seabed? You know, interestingly enough, we saw ice gouges in Perd Bay when we were doing the patch tests. Uh, a lot of ice gouges, deep, uh, very sharp uh, edges, the kind of thing you'd expect to see. But we rarely saw ice gouges in this area. Um, and uh, I, 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 I could speculate uh, why. Uh, I think that's the case, one of which is, is that sediments are moving around too much to, to have ice gouges persist. But I think more uh, probably the other thing is that one of the things that that uh, they they looked at when they looked at when they did the uh, the the last uh, uh, coast uh, coast and geodetic survey mapping up there uh, was that they noted the hydrographer noted that the the edges of these ice gouges are very steep and it was because of the uh, the permafrost. That was holding the uh, uh, holding the angles of you know it was beyond the angle of repose for that for what you would expect from that kind of sediment, and uh, I think what we're seeing out in the out in that those coastal waters is that it's warmed up enough that uh, the permafrost has been lost and so those uh, it even exacerbates the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the um, uh, the persistence, uh, the lack of persistence of the uh, of the gouges, but we didn't see in the side scan record for that entire 50 square kilometers. I don't think we saw one gouge that we could have we could have possibly identified. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, another question has come in. In addition to this webinar, is there potential education and outreach programming underway to disseminate this information to a broader audience? A potential temporary traveling exhibit or anything like that? 
Yeah, we haven't. We've been doing uh, quite a number of presentations. Uh, there's been a lot of press coverage on this uh, when we first released the press uh, the the press reports. Um, uh, there was uh, education. There was an education component because this was a uh, was a uh, signature cruise in ocean exploration and research. Uh, there was an education team that put together an education component. And uh, if you go on the web page, the Ocean Explorer web page, there are uh, education um, uh, there are education modules that were developed for this particular uh, for this particular project as a part of it being a, as a, as a result of it being a signature cruise. Um, you know, I, I I don't see us really doing uh, uh, exhibits necessarily. Uh, we could, uh, but you know, the the uh, 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 it hasn't been contemplated at all. Okay, um, I was curious. Like, what were the the what whaling ports were the these ships coming out of? Is that well, known? Well, yeah, most of they were coming from uh, from the generally from the west coast. Although there were a lot of New Bedford, the, about two thirds of the vessels were from were out of New Bedford. Uh, their last port before they before they uh, uh, for almost all of them was uh, was Honolulu. Um, and they stopped. And in fact, one of the interesting parts of this is, of the 1,219 people, uh, 500 of them were Native Hawaiians, were Kanakas. And so uh, there's a very strong link between this and and Hawaii. Um, it was very common in that at that period. Uh, that was during the golden age, if you will, of whaling, and was uh, Hawaii was one of the major ports. And so uh, having uh, the uh, the, uh, the Native Hawaiians were highly valued as uh, as uh, whaling crews, and uh, by that time there were lots of uh, skilled uh, Native Hawaiians who were brought on to, to, to be uh, whaling, uh, captain, or whaling uh, crews, uh, not just uh, sort of the, uh, the, 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 the grunts in the foxhole, but, uh, but uh, some of them were boat steers, some of them were harpooners, uh, they, were, uh, they were very skilled whalers. Uh, the uh, uh, so the other boats there were some uh, there were some uh, boats from from the west coast from generally from San Francisco which was the rising port at the time, um, and so uh, uh, but but largely this was uh, an event the 1871 event of the 32 vessels that were that were caught in the ice uh, and 31 were lost uh, uh, two third more than two thirds of those were New Bedford boats. So the the brunt of the of the the economic damage that was that was generated to the whaling industry as a result of the 1871 event, uh, which has been variously dis, uh, determined to be in 2015 money anywhere from six million to to 60 million, depending on how you do the conversion, uh, it was a tremendous blow to the uh, to the folks in uh, in New Bedford. Mm, all right, that's fascinating. Um, I was also curious about the the history of human habitation in the area, like how much whaling was going on um, from Native Alaskans and and what were there any ports or, or well, small the, settlements? Well, the, there was there was a, a whaling that was part of the cultural tradition of the Inupiat, and that's gone been going on for 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 a thousand years or more. Um, and t till today, I mean, it's uh, they they still whale on a regular on a regular ba basis in the spring and fall. Um, they uh, uh, they they didn't do shore whaling in the traditional sense uh, like the Yankee whalers did, and and they the, the the way that they went about whaling was was only sort of slightly modified by uh, by the influence of of the, the Yankee whalers. But uh, but the, there was no uh, work in the Western Arctic at all, no whaling in the Western Arctic at all until 1849, and that was when the first whaling vessel went through the strait, uh, which is an interesting story unto itself, the, uh, the Bering Strait, and and entered the Chukchi, uh, and from 1848 to 1914, 1848 to 1914 was really the the, the period of time when whaling persisted. Uh, within about uh, about 20 years from 1848, about 1860, 1870, uh, the two thirds of the bowhead population had been had been taken, and in fact they were uh, relying on on walrus uh, to supplement it because you can boil down walrus blubber just as easily as you can to boil down uh, 
uh, whale blubber, and uh, that was having profound effects on the local population because they rely on, on relied heavily on walrus, and there were um, incidents where entire villages were 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 decimated because they had no food because the Yankee whalers were taking the uh, were taking the walrus. So uh, there was a there there's a as I say a long tradition of of cultural subsistence uh, by the Inupiat in that area. Uh, it's fascinating stuff, and uh, um, at some point it would be great to uh, uh, to sort of mesh these two stories together. But uh, but again, that that takes a lot of time and effort and building trust with the local community to uh, have them tell those stories, which is the way the the appropriate way they should be they should be told. Okay, thank you, Brad. Um, Another question that came in: uh, What was the size of the American whaling fleet at the time? Uh, in 1870, it was around. Uh, it was around. Uh, geez, I want to say it was something like 400 and 440. I'd have to go back and look specifically, but it was in the it was in the the four to five hundred range at the, at the peak uh, of the golden age in the 1860s. Uh, in Honolulu, they had more than 550 ships that entered Honolulu uh, at any given time. So uh, throughout a season, so um, you know the the fleet was pretty big. Uh, at that year, uh, in 1871, there were there were only the the 33 or 34 vessels that were involved in in this in this particular uh, in this particular event, and then the seven vessels that were below icy cape. Uh, that were the rescue vessels that took everybody back to Honolulu. So uh, it was a relatively small fleet that year. Interestingly enough, uh, you know, when the when they first arrived uh, on scene in that area, they met with the local Inupiat elders, and the elders said, "You guys really ought to stick around this year because it's going to the weather's going to be horrible." And uh, of course, they didn't pay attention to it, and they ended up having one of the the greatest disasters in the history of whaling. Wait, had the fleet brought their own rescue vessels, or were they? No, they were they were okay. vessels that were that were actively whaling, but just weren't far okay. that as far up the coast as these other 32 were. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, and they were they were in open water uh, at, in that September of 1871, and they held fast. They actually jettisoned a lot of the a lot of the whale oil and and bone that they had taken that year uh, in order to accommodate an additional 1,219 people. Uh, they, uh, they jettisoned a lot of their own gear uh, in order to make room for these people because the, these boats were not very big. They were 120, 100, 100 to 120 feet long. So uh, uh, fitting 1,200 people in addition to the existing crews and, and officers was, uh, was a big challenge. And so they, uh, they took a big hit as well uh, in terms of the uh, uh, of their uh, their their success that year in in uh, in whaling. Okay, all right. Thank you, Brad. This was this was absolutely fascinating, uh, and we so appreciate you coming to speak. And so I'd just like to thank um, Brad and then the um, the National Marine Protected Area Center for uh, sponsoring the webinar series, and then uh, co-host uh, the MPA News and Open Channels. So uh, I hope everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon, and I uh, hope you, can, you guys can join us for future webinars. And thank you again, Brad. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank everybody for taking the time to 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 uh, tune in and uh, hear about the project. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Good.